Let's go ahead and, and begin with prayer. Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to come this evening to review our history. And as we consider the lives of James and Ellen White, we pray for a special blessing to guide us as we consider only a sample of, of the events in their lives. That we be able to capture that which you want us to see and be um, convicted and and uh, inspired by what we do look at. Give us wisdom, give us your spirit, and direct us, we pray in Christ's name. We thank you. Amen. Well, this evening we are continuing with the next of our pioneers. Uh, this is actually number 16 on our outline um, of the 27 pioneers. This is uh, the life of James White tonight that we're going to be covering. Uh, the issues of lust we forget that relate to James White actually are sort of interwoven with the issues that deal with his wife as well. Uh, they all are in volume five, uh, the four issues of volume five. The first one you can see quite clearly is entitled <laughs> James and Ellen White. Um, that was back in the year 1995 and we featured both of them. That's volume one. Volume two uh, is entitled After October 22. And volume three, volume three is the one on James White. Qualified for the job is the title specifically on him. and His timeline is in that. And then the last one, even though some things in here deal with him, it's mostly on his, his uh, wife, Ellen White. Uh, why a messenger? Uh, that's the one we'll focus a little bit more on um, as we do that. If you look at your handout, um, you'll see the heading there, uh, some highlights of the life of James Springer White. I have a picture of him here on the top um, in his later years. Um, so we'll keep that picture in mind as we go through this. Um, the particular article in the periodical that sort of focuses on his life, even though there's it covers him in several of the articles that we published, is the article entitled James White, a Man of Action in Volume 5, Number 3. And as I mentioned, the numbers 1, 2, and 3 cover his life there. I would recommend um, the books that he did himself of his life. And, it's, and both of them are listed there. They are not identical. Uh, obviously, one is more complete and updated than the other. Although I noticed the table of contents was more complete than the first one. 1868, he wrote Life Incidents. He published Life Incidents. Um, connection with the Great Advent Movement as illustrated by the Three Angels of Revelation 14. So he's tying his Life Incidences to the Advent Movement to Revelation 14. I like that. And then um, in 1880, he came out with uh, Ancestry, Early Life, Christian Experience, and Extensive Labors of Elder James White and his wife, Mrs. Ellen G. White. Um, these are both on the, the CD-ROM, Ellen White Comprehensive uh, Research Edition CD-ROM in the Words of the Evans Pioneer section. Um, that last one that deals with Ellen White as well, you'll find in her collection under LS80, Life Sketches 80. It, it basically is uh, what they, they extracted her part. Um, and just published it under her collection. In James's collection, we have the entire book, even, even the part that, that she uh, contributed. That, like I said, chapters 5 through 9 deal, deal mostly with Ellen White in that last of the books. Okay, so let's begin with the events that we have um, recorded here of his life. Uh, we have so much about both of these individuals that there's no way that on one sheet of paper on two sides we can cover much. So I do encourage you to look at the timelines and the periodical, read the biographies, and um, if you want more, more details. I took mostly uh, the items here out of the timelines that we had in the, in the periodicals and put in some extra things here and there that I thought might fill it out. James White was born August the 4th, 1821 in Palmyra, Maine. He was the middle of nine children. In other words, there were four more to come after him. Uh, when you read his autobiography, the four older ones were living, the four younger ones were all dead. 
which is sort of a little bit opposite of what you'd think would have happened. But um, he mentioned why it was that some of them had died. One of them died coming back from California killed by the Indians. <laughs> so there was, uh, back in those days when people traveling across the United States were at risk. May have, I don't remember the exact, uh, he didn't specify the year that I recall. 1836, he's 15 years old. He's baptized into the Christian Church Fellowship. 1840, at the age of 19, he enters into the academy at St. Albans in Maine, and he soon taught his first school. If you look at the account that he gives of his health, he actually had eye problems. Uh, he, had, he had problems with, um, I don't know whether it was... Uh, divergent gaze type of thing, or there were some things going on that he, he actually, when he got to school, he didn't know anything that the other students knew. He didn't know an adverb from a verb, and, you know, these types of things. So, but he apparently applied himself diligently and was bright and was able to, to not only learn, but he actually became a teacher. He was, was soon teaching. But this is how he describes uh, that, those early years. At the age of 20, which would have been right after uh, he began teaching there, I had buried myself in the spirit of study and school teaching and had lain down the cross. I loved this world more than I loved Christ and the next and was worshiping education instead of the God of heaven. And then he talks about how his mother appealed to him one day. And he had, he had thought of Millerite, the Millerite teaching as, as fanatical. But his mother spoke to him about it in a way that was favorable to the teaching. And it really shook him up because he, he, he honored his mother. He, he, he respected her judgment. And so it really, um, really made him ha have to reexamine this whole thing. And she told him, no less, that his classmates those he'd known growing up had all had their lives had been changed by hearing the Advent message. And so he, he found out that in, that was indeed the case. So the witness of his friends convicted him of the Advent message. He came under a similar conviction to William Miller. Do you remember the story of William Miller? God said to him, the Holy Spirit, um, God, the Holy Spirit said to him one day, you must share what you know. And so James White came under conviction that he should go back to the students that he had taught that previous year and visit them in their homes and bring to them the Advent message. And he felt like this would be a tremendous humiliating thing for him to do, and he resisted it, he re just like William Miller did, uh, maybe for different reasons. But uh, again, he was resisting what the Holy Spirit was convicting him to do. Go back and visit. He had had an excellent year with the students. He had promised them he was going to come back the next year. And he said, if you, if you, um, if you do what you do, did this year, I will have no more rules for you than we had this year. And so he really had a, a good relationship that he had developed with his students. And apparently some of them were his age and some of them were older than he was. That's, that's who, the group that he was teaching. So now he's under conviction to go to the homes of these students and take the Advent message to them. And he, and he said, no way. He actually said he stomped his foot. And he, he went back to school to study some more. But his mind was so convicted he could not focus on his studies. He could have, could have no peace. And he finally had to give up the school. And then he headed out on his mission that he, had, he was convicted he had to do. And he says when he got to the neighborhood where the students were, this wonderful peace flowed into him. Just an amazing uh, story. You need to read it. Very interesting, his description of his own experience. So I'd encourage you to read that. Um, so as, as he went through and, and met with his students, um, actually before he even got there, he was impressed. Uh, stop at this house. It was a log cabin, I think it was. And he said, you know, I don't know these people. Um, I have no reason to stop here. I have no idea what I would tell them if I knocked on the door. And the bright idea came into his mind, ask him for a glass of water. So, so he, he went there, and the man that he met had been weeping. And the man invited him in, and he said, I've just buried my son. And I'm not a Christian, and I have no hope. 
uh, can you help me? And, he, you know, he didn't, he didn't know much what to say. But uh, anyway, story after story like that, the Spirit impressing him to stop at this house and to stop at this house. He was well received by his uh, scholars, he called them, the students and their families. Um, the, the man who hired him was an infidel, but so respected him that he let him pray for him as well. But uh, obviously, you know, didn't really want what he had. Um, amazing story. I encourage you really to read that and, and get a flavor of, of what he's going through. After he finished that, he felt like, my duty's done. But then he's figuring out, what, what am I going to do with my life now? Am I going to be a teacher? And um, he ended up one place, I forget exactly the details of the story, he ended up one place and a lady called him elder, and that shook him. It was like, I'm not an, I'm not an elder, and I'm not a, I'm not a preacher. Um, and it really sort of convicted him as to maybe the direction he should go, though, even though he, re he resisted the whole idea. At one point, he had such a group of people that were interested. I think he said at one, one of his meetings, he had 70 people respond for, for dedication. And he, he didn't know what to do with them because, you know, he had no training. And he, he had this bright idea. One of his brothers was trained as a minister. I'll call him. So he got in touch with his brother, and his brother came and raised up a church. And, he's, and baptized them all. And he said, everyone he baptized, they traced their conviction to when James was sh sharing with them. So anyway, it's an amazing story. And he, so he says here, I finally gave all for Christ in his gospel and found peace and freedom. It's amazing to read these first account, first uh, hand accounts. So that's in his um, Life Incidents, pages 15 and 24. I've taken those from. So that was, again, between the ages of 19 and 20. Uh, 20, uh, age 41, he's joining the Millerites. He also shares the message of the Evan and Troy Maine. In fact, some of the stories that I was recounting may, may relate to that area. I don't recall specifically. Um, the next year, he's 21, um, 1842. Um, September, he first heard William Miller preach at a meeting in what he called the Mammoth Tent. Remember that tent we, we read about? We, we, we referred to in, in looking at, was that Himes that we reviewed that in? I don't remember. One of those men who really got the, the ball rolling with these meetings. And they decided to buy this tent. This mammoth tent in eastern Maine. Um, been, been interesting to see uh, exactly where that was and what happened. Here's how he describes it. Um, that event and coming out, the events after that. On returning from the great camp meeting in eastern Maine, where I heard with deepest interest such men as Miller, Himes and Preble. Remember, Preble was the one who wrote on the Sabbath. And we, Thomas Preble, we don't have a, a specific overview on him, but we sh mentioned him one time when we were talking about the Sabbath. When I showed you a picture of him. I found myself happy in the faith that Christ would come about the year 1843. I had given up all to teach the doctrine to others, and to prepare myself to do this was the great object before me. I had purchased the chart illustrating the prophecies of Daniel and John, used by lecturers at that time, and had a good assortment of publications upon the matter, object, and time of the Second Advent. And with this chart hung before me, and these books and the Bible in my hands, I spent several weeks in close study, which gave me a clearer view of the subject. So he's doing his homework. And... Um, investing his means in what he needs to be prepared. And um, that's from Life Instances, page 72. So what does he do? Obviously, then he begins to go out the very next month and begin preaching the Advent message. 1843. He's ordained in the Christian church. Is that the same as the Christian Connection? I think it is. I think it's called Christian Connection um, as well. Yeah, that's a typo. That's a typo. Yeah, you can you can correct that if it's on yours uh, wrongly. Uh, October of 1842, he began preaching the Advent message. Uh, 1843, he's ordained. 1844, the spring, he first meets Ellen Harmon in Portland, Maine, which is interesting. And when we come to her uh, account of her life, you're going to see some discrepancy, and there there's 
probably a story in that if we really knew what it was. But I gave you the reference here where this is mentioned. Uh, her first uh, biographical volume, page 70, mentions that. She doesn't remember the first day. Exactly. She never does. He did. Right, right. And it very well could have been he was in a meeting where she was relating a vision, and he just he saw her. But she may not have made a personal acquaintance and you know impressed with his, his memory. Um, August of 44, he begins preaching the midnight cry. What happened in August of 44? Remember? That was the beginning of the midnight cry, but what was it that launched the midnight cry in August? Samuel Snow, that was the one we studied that was instrumental in doing it, but what event happened in August of 44? No, <laughs> that's back in 40. Uh, this was the Exeter, New Hampshire camp meeting. Do you remember? Uh, Exeter, New Hampshire camp meeting. This is where the story was that, that Joseph Bates was lecturing on the, on the prophecies and people were sort of um, um, a little bit distracted because they'd heard everything he was saying. And Snow came in and said something to one of the ladies and she stood up and she said, Brother Bates, we've heard all of this. Here's a man who has new light. And he sat down and he invited Snow to come up and he, he presented his study on the midnight cry. But read James White's account of the event. Uh, it's an amazing picture because at this camp meeting, there's groups from all the different, not all the different, but many different places in New England. And they all pitch their tents near each other. And there's one group that's really fanatical. And they're all night long shouting and you know, ho ho hooting and hollering, as we could say, sort of Pentecostal style. And so people actually moved their tents to get away from these people. And they said after Snow presented his presentation, the fanaticism disappeared. Just amazing description of what was taking place there. Moving of the Holy Spirit in the midnight cry. And he began to preach that. Of course, in two months' time, we know the history. Um, the final date which they expected Christ to come passed. Great disappointment. And here is James White's uh, account of that event and his, re his uh, reaction to it. The disappointment at the passing of the time was a bitter one. True believers had given up all for Christ and had shared his presence as never before. In other words, it was not just something they had done, it was something they had experienced. And they, they had the, the sense of his presence, the Holy Spirit uh, presence and, and, and Spirit of Christ. They had, as they supposed, given their last warning to the world and had separated themselves more or less from the unbelieving, scoffing multitude. And with the divine blessing upon them, they felt more like associating with their soon expected master and the holy angels than with those from whom they had separated themselves. The love of Jesus filled every soul. Watch how he describes this. It's, it's amazingly important language. The love of Jesus filled every soul and beamed from every face. And with inexpressible desires, they prayed, Come, Lord Jesus, and come quickly. But he did not come. And now to turn again to the cares of perplexities and dangers of life in full view of the jeers and revilings of unbelievers who now scoffed as never before was a terrible trial of faith and patience. When Elder Himes visited Portland, Maine a few days after the passing of the time and stated that the brethren should prepare for another cold winter, my feelings were almost un controllable. I left the place of meeting and wept like a child. That's his life sketches, page 107. These people were had invested everything in it. And it was not just a mental exercise. It, their lives were wrapped up, their hearts were wrapped up in it. It was deeper than an emotional thing. It was, I think it was a spiritual thing. And um, Again, the degree to which they were committed was the degree to which they were disappointed. And he's describing, I think, very graphically his own experience there. 
We know that in the next year, he's now 24 years old, he accepts the light regarding Jesus as our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. The light that began that very next day with Edson, as we studied, and began to be shared. February of 45, he begins to travel with Ellen Harmon after meeting her in Orrington, Maine. So that's where the, the two connected in a way that Ellen White remembered and actually ended up with him feeling that she needed someone to accompany her. She was very young, and so they began to travel, not alone, but they were traveling, and he was traveling with them. I think she was traveling with another woman to begin with, if I, if I remember the details, and so he felt like they needed a man. So it was a matter of about a year and six months later, they were married, because he, he eventually felt that it, it was not appropriate for them to continue traveling without being married. So he married her August, of, August 30 of 1846 at the age of 25. Later that year, according to our record here, around November, he and Ellen began to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. They had heard about it before and had not felt it was significant, but by November they had become under conviction, both biblically and, of course, uh, we know that Ellen White had some clear direction as to the significance of the Sabbath from visions. The next year, 1847, and you'll notice on these dates where I, put, where I give his age, um, if it's precise enough to me, for me to know his age, I will put his age. If it's, if it's just the year, I sometimes will put, uh, you know, most of the year he's actually, uh, since his birthday is after the middle of the year, most of the year he's actually um, the, year, the age of a year before that, the age of that birthday. So there, it's give or take a year when you're looking at his age. So don't don't uh, be too troubled about whether the uh, ages are maybe look like they're off a little bit. So May of 47, he's 25 years old, and he published a word to the little flock that uh, his wife had written. And uh, this is under WLF code, if you want to look on the CD-ROM. This was clearly one of the earliest things that was published. Um, and it was just a very short document. It was not at length. There are other um, things that you, we will, you can find that relate to um, her earlier visions, um, but she was not publishing them, apparently, at that point. I do believe there were some letters that may have been published that she sent into some of the Advent periodicals. Um, but this is the first thing that they, uh, they're doing uh, as a as a couple, as I understand. Later that same year, August the 26th of 1847, James's first son, Henry, is born in Topsom, Maine. The next year, April of 1848, begins a series of what is sometimes called conferences. They don't always, when you read the autobiographies, they don't always call them conferences. They were meetings or gatherings. And I was amazed how many of these were in barns. <laughs> uh, there, weren't, there weren't large groups like they needed huge tents for, so they'd go to somebody's house, and the best place they could meet was in the barn, apparently. Bigger than the house, and uh, was comfortable. So I didn't put it down which ones were in the barns because I didn't have room for that. But there, here are these series of meetings that have become known as the uh, Sabbath conferences or the 1848 conferences. And you'll see here a list of six of them that all occurred from April of 1848 through uh, November of that same year. The first one was in Rocky Hill, Connecticut. I've given you some references in his uh, autobiographical works where he mentioned some of these that I could clearly identify as the ones that we have in, the, in our timeline. Uh, that was April. And so we, then four months later, we come to August. Um, he's actually had another birthday, so now he's 27. The second Bible conference is held in Bolton, in New York. And uh, there was more unity at, obtained at that point uh, among the 
Advent believers who were who were believing in the Sabbath and the sanctuary message. Um, the first one was in Life Instances, one, page 172. That, that second one was mentioned in Life Sketches, page 247. Later the same month, August the 27th, a third conference was held. This was in Port Gibson, uh, New York, and that's in Life Sketches 249. And then uh, the, the 8th of the next month, of September, they have another conference in Rocky Hill, Connecticut. This is just south of Hartford, uh, back to where the first one was. And that goes clear uh, through, the, through the 9th, uh, the 8th and 9th, those, those two days in September. The next month in October, they have another, uh, the fifth of the Bible conferences is back in Topsom, Maine, and that goes through um, the 22nd of October, which I, that's probably some significance there. This is the fourth anniversary of the disappointment, right? And then in November, they have the sixth one in Dorchester, Massachusetts, and they begin to understand what the ceiling is all about. Um, I believe it was Joseph Bates that, that, uh, shared information on that, if I recall correctly. November, the same month that this last conference was held, on the 18th, Ellen White receives a vision for James to begin publishing. Uh, in other words, he had already, they'd already published this vision, that she, the word to the little flock that she had had, but now she's given light that he should begin a regular publishing effort. And recall, uh, the Advent movement had used publishing extensively from the very, very earliest days of it. And so this was not something that they were unfamiliar with. They'd just never done it themselves. And the, the light of the third angel had not been shared through this medium that much. They had had meetings. Again, the two main ministries that come out of the Ad Advent movement are uh, meetings and publishing. <laughs> They've been using the meetings, but they had not gotten into publishing. And now they now they're, he was being directed uh, to begin that ministry. The next year, uh, May of 49, they leave Henry in care of the Hallands because James and Ellen are traveling extensively. And you can imagine how difficult it would be in those days without the conveniences of automobiles and whatever else to travel in horse and buggy and you know, a, a very young child. Um, by that time, Henry was born, when was it? August of 47. And so he's, uh, he's not even two years old here. Um, he's a toddler at that time. Uh, June of, of 49, he, they're living in Rocky Hill, Connecticut. Um, and in July, the first issue of Present Truth comes off the press. He begins a periodical call, Present Truth. Now, what do you think um, his focus is on in his periodical, Present Truth? What do you think he's talking about mostly? Sabbath. Sabbath. What, other, what other particular uh, belief is under the third angel's message? Sanctuary, right. So the Present Truth for, for James White at that time would be the unique understandings of the Adventists that were going down this track of Sabbath and sanctuary. And so he calls that present truth. Um, the same month, his second son is born, James Edson. Named, same first name, but he has middle name Edson, and he goes the rest of his life mostly by that middle name, Edson White. The next year, they're leaving him in care of a sister, Bonfoy. James was suffering from poor health, but he continues writing and publishing. In August of that year, he starts another periodical entitled The Advent Review. Now, why do you think it's called that? What is he doing? Well, it's obviously on the second coming, but it, that's, it just doesn't say the Advent, uh, the review. He's already reviewing the history of the Advent movement. You know, if it's important for us, he actually felt it was important for them, right there on the, on the heels of the movement. So he's beginning to review the Advent, because you can, you can understand, there were people who were giving up their faith in, in the second coming of Christ because of the disappointment, and you know, they thought, well, maybe it was going to be the next year or the next year, and just, it was going on year after year now, and Christ was not coming. So he goes back to review the evidences for the fact 
that, it, that indeed it still is a belief that we should hold that Christ is coming. And so he begins to review that. In November, which is just three months later, what does he do? He, he, he puts the two together. Can you see it in the title? Second Advent Review was the second one he started, and Sabbath Herald. <laughs> Present truth, right? <laughs> and so there's the origins of, of what we have known through the years as the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. That's, that's basically the sequence of events, that how it came about that, he, that, that was named that way. Um, is it still important for us to do both? To review <laughs> our history? And to herald um, the Sabbath message, which is the sealing message, right? And of course, in its in its widest uh, application, the Sabbath actually can't. You can think of it as including the sanctuary message, because they found the Sabbath when they went into the most holy place <laughs> in the sanctuary, and they found the ark, and inside the law there was the ten, fourth commandment, right? So we can see that there uh, can easily be uh, seen as connected there. The next year, 1851, August, he's 30 years old. They're living now in Saratoga Springs, New York. This is north of Albany. So it's eastern New York, a little bit north of Albany there. And you'll see, if you look back, uh, I didn't attempt to do this, but if you look back on the CD-ROM at the periodicals, you know, follow the present truth through and look at the uh, Advent Review uh, issues and then look at the ones, the Second Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. By the way, the Second Advent Review and Sabbath Herald was not called Second Advent Review, I think, other than Volume 1. Then he dropped the word second. It became the Advent Review, the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. Then they finally just dropped the article and it became Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. So there were some alterations, but you can see the basic name. Um, and if you look at the title pages on those issues, you'll see where he was because the, the location that it was published indicates, you know, Maine and Connecticut and New York and um, Saratoga Springs was one place. Then finally, uh, April of 52, they moved to Rochester, which is in the western part of New York, underneath Lake Ontario. And this, they sort of settled down there. They were moving around quite a bit, and they settled down there for a while. Actually, just about uh, about three, uh, three and a half years. But a lot of the issues you'll see are coming out of Rochester. And it was there, that summer, that they began to get even more involved with the publishing work. Because they decided we're not going to pay other printers to print our periodical for us anymore. We're going to buy a press ourselves, <laughs> and we're going to we're going to publish it ourselves, um, and the print it ourselves. I should say they were the publishers, but they were going to print it. So they bought a press, and as I understand the story, they put it in the living room of the house they were staying in, right? And they um, they they lived where they worked, which is what some people still do. Um, God still works out of homes, right? August of that year, he begins another periodical. You recognize the name? Youth's Instructor. And that was published clear into my lifetime. <laughs> um, and I remember uh, seeing issues of that. Yeah. It, it, was, a, it was a blessed, uh, a blessed um, periodical. Blessed many people, many young people growing up through the years. Um, so then... Um, we come now down to 1854, May 23. Um, even though they're in Rochester, they are traveling. And um, that's an incident where you can read about their lives being saved in a train wreck on the way to Wisconsin. May 23, 1854. August 29 of the same year, their third son, William Clarence, is born. Uh, obviously, he's, uh, they're in Rochester there. And uh, W.C. Uh, White uh, was the son who became um, Ellen's uh, main assistant through the last part of her life after the death of James and clear to the end of her life. Uh, he was, uh, and it's very interesting to read what she said about him. Um, if you want to, what, what the Lord told Ellen White about William, about W.C. White. That uh, what purpose he had had uh, for William? Yeah, he was born. 
He was born with a purpose to to assist his mother, and he would be given divine wisdom to know how to to ad, ad, administer things. Yes. Yeah. Very 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 uh, interesting comments. Yeah, and, if you ever read uh, after her death, mm -hmm. and you read his story mm -hmm. when he was there at Elm State and the way he felt. Mm. Right. What do I do? Just totally changed. Right. Yeah, I can imagine it. If he invested his life, probably a lot. From '81 is when his dad died, you know, and she died in 34 years later. So this was this was probably over half of his life for sure, um, or, or at least half of his life because he was born in the '50s here. So it's about 30 years later his dad dies, and 30 years later his mom dies. So he's uh, yeah. So he, it would have been a very difficult adjustment for him. Yeah. 1855, the next year, um, Willie's just a year old about. They move from Rochester, and they move to Battle Creek, Michigan. James moves there, and he builds his own home. Um, it's interesting to read James's description of his father, how he was a man of great physical and mental strength, <laughs> and how he cleaned, cleaned the... You know, this was back in New England, of course, and how he cleaned the land of the trees all in by himself. You know, and just so these were these were people who had uh, learned hard work and were able to do uh, hard work as well. Um, so that's in, they're now in Michigan, which in those years was out west, right? Out west, not for us at all, for sure. But uh, you got to think of the perspective of the 13 original colonies, right? That was in the west. Now we move on uh, uh, a little bit further down here, 1860, he's 39 years old, and on September 20th, his fourth son, John Herbert, is born. The same year, just a few days later, he's involved with helping this group of Sabbath-keeping Adventists to adopt their official name, Seventh-day Adventist. And later the same year, that son that was born in September dies. I don't remember the details of what he did. You did? Uh -huh. Erysipelas. Yeah. Okay. Erysipelas. It's a it's a bacterial disease, um, that a bacterial skin infection. But that, it was swollen. Yeah. I can I can imagine that he probably became more than just a skin infection. But he became probably septicemia, yeah. and uh, yeah. So they didn't have good ways of treating infectious diseases back then. Although when I was reading, <laughs> I was reading, uh, preparing for this, there was one time where I think it was three of their sons, don't remember uh, exactly what point in the process here that uh, it happened, they came down with diph diphtheria. And, and there was an epidemic of diphtheria going around. And they had read somewhere, somebody said, take, uh, take Spanish flies, grind them up in turpentine, and put them on the throat, and it will blister, blister the skin, and that will cause the infection. <laughs> and but then they had also read uh, a report from a doctor in New York who told how to give water baths, and how that he didn't have anyone dying when he did that. And they thought that makes a lot more sense than doing flies and turpentine. And so they they did it with their kids, and they all survived. And uh, there was another family. Was it? I think it was the Smith family. The Smiths were out of town, and their kids got sick, and they had to run over there and do it for them. You know, so it was really. Uh, again, you can imagine in those days where infectious disease killed many children, that it was an urgent thing, and the parents had really were concerned when when their children started showing symptoms of, of sore throats and things like that. It wasn't just uh, how we look at them today by any means. The next year, 1861, May the 3rd, at the age of 39, James helps incorporate the Seventh-day Adventist Publishing Association. Um, I was reading about that, and they said they actually had to wait until the, the Michigan legislature uh, designed the law that enabled them to incorporate. So they were pushing the envelope, I guess, in terms of the state of Michigan for businesses and incorporations and things like that. And they uh, got incorporated there in 1861. Again, what's happening in the country around that time? Civil war. That's right. This is Civil War time. Beginning of the. It's it's a time of trouble. Not for Michigan, because the 
there were no battles that I know of in Michigan, but many of the families in Michigan were sending their sons to, to fight, and so they were definitely involved. Uh, 1863, May the 20th, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists formed. They wanted to elect James White as president. He declined. Why do you think he declined? No, that's a good deduction from what's written right next here. <laughs> the, he had been pushing so hard for organization. And others, as we remember the story from Cottrell and others, there were others who said, we should not organize, that's Babylon, you know. That's making us a name, choosing these name things and organizing. And, but James was pushing for this gospel order. And so he said, They're, they will think that I was pushing for order because I could be president. So when they finally did organize, he, re, he declined to be president because he wanted to make it clear, this is not why I was wanting us to organize, so I could have a position of president. So he declined that. Um, very wise. That's very wise, yeah. Because even though your motives might be correct, others will often misjudge you. And so you do what you can to try to prevent misjudgment. Now, it doesn't always prevent it, because there's, if you read his, his life story, one of, the, uh, one of the major things he struggled with was being misunderstood by his brethren <laughs> and how to relate to that. So it might be, uh, we'll, we'll maybe look at a little bit of that here uh, briefly. December the 8th, his first son, Henry, dies as a teenager. So he lo loses two of his, uh, of his four sons um, while he's still living. May, the, May of uh, 1865, at the age of 43, he does become a president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. He keeps that position for the next two years um, in his 40s. But we've alluded to the fact back in 1850 that he suffered from poor health. Even though he was a strong man and he did many uh, pioneering ventures, he did have health problems that, that he battled with. I would imagine from what you, what you see happen to him overall health-wise that he probably had high blood pressure. Um, because in, in 1865, August 16, at the age of 44, he's stricken with paralysis. He has a stroke. And he goes to Dansville, New York, which is where this doctor that talked about, uh, about water treatments, uh, they'd actually visited there the year before, um, as I recall. And they, he, he goes back there to get treatment as well. But, and, and Ellen White invests a lot of her time, obviously, in caring for him during this time. By January of 67, at the age of 45, his health is restored and he builds a new home in Greenville, Michigan. In 1869, May, he's 47, and he be, again becomes president of the General Conference. And he holds that position through 1871, again, for another two years. 1871, he becomes editor of the Health Reformer, an early uh, health journal that we're publishing there in Battle Creek, associated with the Western Health Reform Institute, which had been established some five years earlier. Um, 1872, at the age of 51, he works to establish the first SDA college, and he makes one of several extended visits to California. This is the first time they go to California. Do you remember the year that the work came to California officially? We haven't covered Loughborough's life yet, because that's where we'll really focus on him. It was four years before this, 1868. So, but 1869 was when the railroad finally connected. Loughborough didn't go out by railroad. He went out by boat through, through Panama and up the West Coast. And the only other way was by ox cart, right, across the plains. As soon as the trains were there, um, just a, within a few years, uh, James and Ella were going to California. And, ex and extended visits, uh, they're not just going out for short visits. They're going out and staying for weeks and months. And they are seeing uh, the work really starting to, to take hold here under Loughborough and the others. And... Um, one time they were selling more literature west of the Rockies than they were east, in spite of the fact that the work had ex existed in the east of the Rockies for many, many years, you know, through all, all those northern tier states. Um, so the work really was taking off here, and so they felt the need to come out, because um, you can see what happened. <laughs> um, in 
just a couple of years, uh, June of 74, he's 52 now, he starts the Signs of the Times in Oakland. This is our sort of missionary paper. The, the Advent Review and Sabbath Herald is our church paper going to church members. This is for a mission, missionary outreach. Um, I find it interesting that we had a health outreach paper before we had a, a general evangelistic uh, outreach paper. Um, he was editor of the Signs of the Times until his death. And he began the precursor, he built the precursor to the Pacific Press, and he equipped it there in Oakland. Same year, August of 1874, he's now um, 53. He again becomes president of the General Conference. And he holds that position now for six years, during basically the last decade of his life. And um, you can imagine the pressure of the work. He's administrator, <laughs> he's an editor, Right, and whatever else he's doing, you know, with with the church is he uh, he's very very involved, overly involved, as we will find out. 1875, April, the age of 53, he officially organizes the Pacific Press uh, on the West Coast to uh, to publish things uh, from for the uh, church in the West. And obviously, we know we can see why he called it Pacific Press. Um, 1877, a couple years later, August, he's 56, he, he is nearly paralyzed, again, by another stroke, and he's left weak. I didn't record here all of them, but I know he had at least four strokes in his lifetime, and uh, so he, had, he was having recurrent strokes. 1878, they lived, lived in Texas for a while, and then 1880, he's back at the age of 59 uh, in Battle Creek, Michigan, and makes plans, if you read... Um, the account of his wife of those summer months, which is in her description um, of him that she published after he died, in memoriam. She describes the last weeks that they had together, not knowing that he was going to die. Um, they were going out into the grove to pray together, and they were making plans. They were making plans to go to the West Coast, to spend the winter, and to write. He says, we've made a mistake. We've been traveling too much and speaking. We need to write more. And you can understand why. In those years, unless you had a stenographer, what you said was gone. No recordings or whatever else, but what you wrote remained. And they, they began to realize we need to write. What, and he says we need to write on the glorious subject of redemption that God has been opening to our minds. And she said that she was in good health. Yes. He had recovered, apparently, from these strokes, and he was in good health. Mm -hmm. Out in the outskirts of Healdsburg. Okay, that's right. Outside of Healdsburg, yeah. they had a I've had a farm. I've been there and seen it. It's mm -hmm. been sold again several times. So right. I think Evans can visit and mm -hmm. pictures. Right. Because I think there's a vineyard out there now. And they let us uh, go inside and see it. Okay. It's a fireplace and everything. Mm -hmm. yeah, a, mm -hmm. He was hoping to be able to visit right. the farm. And apparently it was in these years that Ellen White uh, would later recount that these things that God was opening to their minds, this glorious subject of redemption, she said they would talk about it to where they couldn't sleep at night. Um, and this, this is then recounted by Ellen White at the end of the 1880s when she hears Wagner, E.J. E. Wagner, and she says, this is the clearest teaching I have heard from human lips outside of conversations with my husband. Subject of righteousness by faith. So he was going to write on that, and he never got the chance to do it. So it makes you wonder what James White would have done at Minneapolis had he been alive. Um, it, it's it's interesting. For some reason, yeah. For some reason, the Lord saw, saw to lay him to rest, and he died August the sixth, eighteen eighty one, after a short illness with malaria. They both got ill. Ellen recovered, and James died. Like a That's what they called it, malarial fever. Uh, it, it, who knows, they probably were not diagnosing malaria with blood smears back then. So it was probably, uh, if they got a sudden chill and a fever, they may have, they may have thought it was a malarial type of thing. Um, but that was what I, I believe the doctor said it was. He was buried uh, seven days later at Oak Hill Cemetery, Battle Creek, Michigan, and you can visit the grave there. I liked this description that he gave of um, his, um, 
his involvement with the Advent movement. This is in the beginning of his life incidents, 1868. The title page of this work, if, if you look back at the beginning, uh, I gave you the title, uh, that long title, Connection with the Great Advent Movement, as illustrated by the Three Angels of Revelation 14. He says, the title of this work calls attention to the Great Advent Movement as illustrated by the Three Angels of Revelation 14. The truth and work of God in this movement, commencing with the labor of William Miller and reaching to the close of probation, is illustrated by these three angels. The first was a time message. The, time, the hour of his judgment has come, right? And related to the judgment. The second described the condition of corrupted Christianity. The third is a solemn warning relative to what men may not do and what they must do in order to be saved at the second coming of Christ. You must not worship the beast and receive his mark. You must keep commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, right? That's what he's talking about there. These angels illustrate the three great divisions of the genuine movement. In other words, he's saying the genuine Advent movement didn't stop with Miller. We continue with the third one. Obviously, he's making that point. They do not illustrate the numerous time movements which have appeared since 1844. In other words, these distractions. <laughs> to say the very least, these movements were not from heaven. Seventh-day Adventists hold fast the great Advent movement, hence have use for the messages. They explain them in their sermons, treat upon them in their books, give them a place with other prophetic symbols upon their charts. They cannot spare these links in the golden chain of truth that connect the past with the present and future, and show a beautiful harmony in the great whole. So, our challenge today is still in our sermons, in our books, <laughs> in whatever we do, to keep fresh in people's minds these messages. Are there any more messages before the coming of Christ? You could say, Revelation 18, they call that the loud cry of the third angel. There are no messages, because in Revelation 14, right after these messages, John sees the Son of Man coming. So, it may have been 150 years ago that they were talking about these things to begin with. But we should not think the time has passed. They are still the message for this time. They are, what? Current truth. They apply to us still. And this is why it's so vital that we, that we recapture these in the way that we ought. And then we encourage our pastors and our writers to deal with them. They are still of vital importance. If you want to do an amazing study, just do a study of what Ellen White has to say about these messages. First angel's message, second angel's message, third angel's message. Again, they're cumulative. Just because they came in sequence doesn't mean the first one ended when the second one came. They, they join each other and, and they are still going. And they are still the messages to prepare people for Christ's coming. So that's the challenge that we face. And Revelation 18's message is Right. Revelation 18 is the message of righteousness by faith, which is mentioned in the in the second thing on the banner that the third angel unfurls. The faith of Jesus. There it is. And that's what we need to, to recapture. I was going to read to you the short article on James White in this, but we've run out of time. So I encourage you to, to get that, volume five, number three, qualified for the job. And it speaks about what James went through and the mistakes that he made in his life, neglecting devotions, neglecting his family because of working, working, working with these projects for the Lord. Uh, and Ellen White's quite clear on that. And um, she, but she does say how God had, had, had used him. Um, and how God had raised him up to for the very position that he, he had, had done. So it's very useful to review that. Any other thoughts or observations on James White? Okay, we'll go on to the next one.